I'd like to welcome everyone to this event, Combating Food Insecurity, What's Working and What's Scalable. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping remarks. Speaking lines are muted except for the panelists. Q&A is available after the panel discussion. Closed captions are available via the multimedia viewer on the lower right-hand corner of your event window. Please select Continue to view them. Then enter the password in all caps, FRB Food 1130. That's FRB Food 1130. This event is being recorded and will be posted onto the New York Fed's public website for later viewing. Now I welcome John C. Williams, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to provide opening remarks. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. We're pleased that so many of you have joined us today for this important discussion about food insecurity. Now, it's not lost on me that we're holding this event just five days after Thanksgiving, a holiday that's largely centered around food, the turkey, the stuffing, the potatoes, and the pumpkin pie. And for some of us, the big concern coming out of the weekend was whether we had eaten too much. But for, but for far too many, the much bigger concern is that they and their families do not, and still do not, have enough to eat. That's what brings us here today. Our mission at the New York Fed is to make the economy stronger and the financial system more stable for all. But we can't have a healthy economy without a healthy workforce. And that's why health, along with health and financial well-being and climate change, is a focal point for our community development team. And before I continue, I must give the standard Fed disclaimer that the views I express are my own and not necessarily those of the Federal Open Market Committee or anyone else in the Federal Reserve System. Food insecurity has long been a systemic problem. Here in the Federal Reserve's second district, many households in both our urban and our rural communities are vulnerable financially. And since the onset of the pandemic, access to quality, nutritious food has been greatly impeded. After many businesses were forced to shut down in the spring of 2020, food banks were quickly overwhelmed. In addition to an abrupt increase in need, there was a challenge of distribution. I'm sure many of you remember the long lines to food pantries to stretch through neighborhoods. And many of our schools shifted from providing free lunches to students to offering grab and go meals to entire families. Now we're facing another economic challenge and that's higher food prices. Transportation and labor costs along with supply chain disruptions are driving up the price of many staples, such as beef, poultry, eggs, peanut butter, and produce. Food's not only becoming far more expensive for families, but also for food banks, which at the same time are recording fewer donations. <clears throat> the result of all this is that food insecurity is becoming more widespread and more difficult to resolve. The ripple effects expand across the economy as food insecurity drives economic inequality, which in turn is a barrier to cultivating a healthy workforce. And a healthy workforce is what we need to keep our economy strong. At the New York Fed and across the Federal Reserve System, one of our key areas of focus is to better understand the economic drivers and social determinants of health. We've been hosting a series of events to bring together experts on economic inequality and the needs of low and moderate income communities in our district. Today's event on food insecurity is part of that larger effort. But we recognize it's not enough to merely study the issue. The role of our community, de community development team is to champion promising solutions by connecting people, programs, and proposals with funding. Up to 40% of food produced in the United States goes to waste each year. So there's a huge opportunity to distribute that unused food to those who need it. You'll be hearing more about that later today. But first, we'll start with a presentation from Professor Tashara Leek. She'll frame the discussion by talking about how food insecurity affects the health of children and how that in turn shapes the economic prospects as they grow older. Then we'll have a panel of business and government leaders along with impact investors who will spotlight some of the innovative work being done to make healthy and affordable food more accessible. Thank you for joining us. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Leek. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be here with you all today. As previously noted, I am Dr. Tashara Leek. I am a professor at Cornell University in the Division of Nutritional Sciences. I am also a professor in the Division of General Internal Medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine, which is based in New York City. 
most of my research is centered around how do we actually address the ways in which structural racism and poverty impact the lives of adolescents? And how does that impact what they eat? And I, a lot of times, provide education to adolescents about what is healthy, what is less healthy, but it doesn't matter much if their communities don't have access to healthy foods. It becomes a huge barrier. So while I'm also targeting the individual health and nutrition status of adolescents at the same time, I'm working with bodegas, which are the grocery stores in New York City. Families and adolescents are going there before and after school, before and after work. They're going there during lunch times. So how do we support the bodegas to provide healthier food options for their customers? So I'm gonna now start with a presentation that's very brief around what is actual food insecurity? What are social determinants health? Why should we care about it? And what do we do next? Next slide. There's only three things I want you to take away from my very short presentation. One is that food insecurity is a public health crisis. We should be talking about food insecurity the same way we're talking about COVID, the same way that we've talked about other infectious diseases in the past. The difference is that food insecurity moves more slowly. It's associated with poor health outcomes such as overweight and obesity, with various forms of cancer and other chronic diseases. Also, food insecurity is strongly linked to other social determinants of health. So what are social determinants of health? These are other factors that impact our health. So things like housing. So food insecurity doesn't function in a bubble. It functions also in alignment with housing insecurity, employment insecurity, education inequities. And lastly, I want us to think about sustainability and scalability. We need solutions now. This is an emergent issue. Next slide. So I just want us to be on the same page about what are we actually talking about? So when we're talking about food insecurity, the US Department of Agriculture has defined this as food, it's food security means access by all people at all times to enough food for an active and healthy life. So the key words here are for an active and healthy life. So what about social determinants of health? What do we mean by that? Next slide. So this image comes from the CDC, and it's a really important one that we should all be aware of, which identifies what are some of these key drivers to health. So it acknowledges the role that education and education access plays, that healthcare access and quality plays, neighborhood and the built environment. So this is where those bodegas and grocery stores fall into place. Also, other social and community aspects. And last, of course, economic stability. Next slide. So how do we make this real? I wanna tell just a short story with one of the adolescents that I worked very closely with for several years. During the pandemic, I'm not, as has been stated in multiple environments, this adolescent was attending this amazing high school in Manhattan. She is the first person in her family with the potential to go to college um, she is in a household that predominantly speaks Spanish. Multiple times she has shared to me what that experience has been like as an immigrant into this country, having to often translate for her parents at doctor's appointments. Also, how to navigate applying to high school in New York City um, when your parents need to come visit the high school, but you live in Brooklyn, your school is in Manhattan, but your parents work in the Bronx. And so one of the things, as soon as the pandemic hit, I called to check on her as I did with most of the adolescents that I work with. And I asked, how are things going in their household? And of course, news stories like this come out in the times where we see this huge drop in unemployment. And for her, both of her parents were laid off within 60 days of the start of the pandemic. One of which worked in a restaurant, the other worked in retail. And the conversation she had was, when I asked about food access, she said, yes, we're struggling, but we're okay, we're still being fed. I inquired about, ha has she gone to pick up grab and go lunches for her and her siblings, since she is the oldest and responsible for taking care of her younger siblings. And she said, no, those programs are for other people, not for me. And it made me realize that this idea that she felt that there was someone worse off than her and her family, again, both parents having been laid off so soon, 
and that she was still reserving what was available to her and her siblings for others who she felt like were worse off. And it was a perfect example of how I saw the intersection between employment and food insecurity. Next slide. Additionally, housing, of course, became an issue. We've seen articles like this countless times, and we've heard the stories where we saw a huge increase in unemployment, and then we have this experience where people are struggling to pay their rent. We have landlords who are suing tenants because they have to pay the banks, but then also the people living in those homes don't have anywhere to live. And this, in this situation with this adolescent that I'm referring to, her family did have to move because they were no longer able to afford the household that they were living in. So again, we are dealing with employment insecurity, housing insecurity, and also food insecurity at the same time. Next slide. And lastly, we also have to talk about education inequities. During this time, countless kids are sent home to be online when they live in houses that don't have access to the internet that, and they don't have access to screen devices where they can actually adequately do their homework. So we're having conversations. Luckily, I am very fortunate where as a professor at Cornell University, I was able to loan the adolescents that I work with closely iPads to do their work, but that's a Band-Aid on a broken bone. So I just wanted to briefly highlight again that food insecurity doesn't work in isolation. We should care about food insecurity because the people who are experiencing food insecurity are also most likely experiencing in unemployment. They are also most likely experiencing education inequities. They are also most likely experiencing housing insecurity. So what do we do now? Next slide. We are at the end of November. We have about 30 days left in this, in this, in this year. And the reason I was really excited about coming here today is because I got the feeling that I was going to be amongst doers, the people who are about action, not just studying problems, but people who are about solutions. So I hope that today we all commit to doing something, something within our organizations, something within our communities to actually address food insecurity, this pressing public health crisis. So the first thing we need to do is actually identify households and communities that are disproportionately impacted by food insecurity. And I know for certain that we have several amazing speakers, especially Kate McKenzie, from, who is the Director of Food Policy in the Mayor's Office, who can help us identify who's high risk. The second thing we have to commit to is working across sectors to identify sustainable and scalable solutions. We can't work in isolation. We need to work together, both myself as an academic and a researcher and a scientist. We need to work with those who work in community organizations. We need to work with the Federal Reserve. All together, collectively, we can come up with these solutions. And lastly, we need to actually act. So again, I really urge us all to think about what is it that we're actually going to do? What are the action steps that we're gonna take in the next 30 days to make sure that we have a plan moving forward to address food insecurity, not just in New York City, this amazing city, but also in New York State. And with that, I close. Um, I welcome individuals and organizations to contact me and my team. All of my research is based in New York City. Um, here is my email address, my website, my Twitter handle, and how you can contact me on LinkedIn. I have a new position that will start in January as the co-director for the Action Research Center at Cornell, which will function in many ways like a think tank. I like to call us professional problem solvers. It's a place where you can go to identify researchers and academics to work with policymakers, community organizations, community members to identify solutions to pressing issues like food insecurity. Thank you for your time and I will pass it on to the next group of panelists. Thank you, Tashara. That was, that was excellent. Uh, so we have 40 minutes for the conversation this morning, and I want to make the most of our time. So as we know, as we heard, you know, the topic of food insecurity has been a pressing problem in the U.S. for, for many years, and is now exacerbated by the pandemic and current economic conditions. And we know that no region across the country is immune, as food ex insecurity exists in rural, suburban, and urban communities. So our objective today is really to highlight market-based solutions and interventions that help reduce food waste and food loss and ensure healthy and affordable food is accessible to all. We'll also hear from investors who understand the space, who understand what the investable opportunities are, and 
learn about their theory of change that supports investment. So joining the panel today, and we're really pleased to have, to have the following folks uh, with us here, is Eamon Anderson, who is Director of Action in America, where he invests in early stage of for-profit companies that are tackling problems of poverty across the U.S. Kate McKenzie is Director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Food Policy. Kate advises the mayor on all issues related to food policy and the city's food system. She also leads the interagency COVID-19 food response. Nate Mook serves as Chief Executive Officer at World Central Kitchen, and where he oversees operations, leads the organization's emergency and disaster relief efforts, as well as his long-term impact projects. Nate formally joined World Central Kitchen after helping to create and lead the Chefs for Puerto Rico effort in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Michael Rinaldi is Vice President of Sustainable Business Development at Rabobank, where he focuses on innovative financial solutions that empower the largest food and agriculture companies in North America to achieve their sustainability ambitions. And finally, Kimberly Smith is Chief Growth Officer at Copia, a technology company that has developed the world's first automated platform addressing both hunger and food waste. So before we start off, I just wanna let the audience know that we'll be taking questions in the latter part of this panel discussion. If you have any questions, please submit them via the Q&A panel towards the bottom right of, of the WebEx window. So thank you all for joining. So let's start with Nate from World Central Kitchen. So World Central Kitchen is playing an important role in responding to natural and man-made disasters, uh, providing food security in several areas across the globe and right here in the United States. So, so Nate, tell us, how do, you, how do you work with local communities to ensure they develop tools so their food systems are more resilient and self-sufficient? Yeah, thanks so much, Javier, and a great question. You know, we, we saw this uh, when we first went down to Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, that one of the big challenges in providing uh, food assistance, especially after a disaster, is that sometimes it can be very difficult to bring things in from the outside, and you're not really leveraging the resources that are already there in uh, a community. So, you know, one of the first things that we did in Puerto Rico was we we looked at the landscape of the food producers and distributors and suppliers on the island, and we were able to activate uh, those resources to get food to hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans, uh, while the a lot of the other response took much longer um, because they were trying to bring things in by plane or boat. Uh, one example was FEMA trying to bring in bread from Miami. We were able to activate local bakeries just by making sure they had fuel for their generators. So, you know, thinking more locally about how you can support what's already there um, is often the most effective and efficient way, and also is just so much better for that local economy that, that took a hit, as we heard uh, about the impacts, of course, during COVID. So for all of our work, and whether it's um, you know, a, a, a big natural disaster like a hurricane or a wildfire, or even a refugee crisis uh, on our southern border, or during COVID, where we worked extensively across the United States and, and uh, very heavily in, in New York City as well, um, you know, one of the ways that we were able to do that was by partnering with and activating the local restaurants. Um, so, you know, we, we couldn't set up a kitchen and be everywhere, but by working with those local restaurants, we could put them back to work. We had about 150 restaurant partners across New York City. We were producing well over 100,000 fresh meals a day from those restaurants. So we were paying those restaurants. They could keep their staff employed. They could keep the business running. Um, all while we were at World Central Kitchen, sort of playing air traffic controller to make sure that food could go to the places where it was needed most, partnering with, you know, NYCHA uh, housing locations and, and local community-based organizations to identify those residents in need. And as we look further, I think one of the biggest things that came out initially out of our work in Puerto Rico was really sort of understanding why was there that food insecurity in the first place, right? What we see after a disaster or even during COVID is not necessarily that this is a new problem. It's that the, the individuals, the families that were already vulnerable, that already needed food assistance were most impacted. And we see this, I was just down in Louisiana, in New Orleans after Hurricane Ida. And if you look at the folks who were without food and New Orleans lost power for about 10 days down there, um, you know, it was those communities that were already marginalized, that were already vulnerable, that don't have access to fresh, nutritious food regularly. There's no grocery store within a two mile radius. You know, those are the issues that then get exacerbated by 
um, you know, by disasters and by COVID. And we saw this, of course, across the country, you know, shining a spotlight on the fragility of our food system. So one of the things that we're doing, and of course, we're, we're a fairly small nonprofit at the end, but um, is really looking at how we can start to step by step improve that. So in Puerto Rico, for example, after Hurricane Maria, we launched what we call our food producer network. We have over 250 grantees on the island. We teach uh, uh, business skills, agriculture. We have market access programs. We run farmers markets. We work with big buyers like Walmart and Marriott to get some of that local production um, to make sure that if we can increase Puerto Rico's ability to produce its own food, uh, when the next disaster hits, then it will not be as susceptible to, um, you know, to the issues that it saw before. So these are just some examples, but, but there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, we, we've seen this during COVID and there's a lot of amazing, amazing projects going on. Uh, thank you, Nate. Now, now, and I'm glad that you brought this issue of taking advantage of local assets of what's already in the community. Let me bring in Kate. Um, Kate, you have a bird's eye view of the food system here across New York City. Your office is responsible for various programs that help ensure New Yorkers have access to healthy, affordable, and culturally appropriate food. So there are different approaches for address food waste and also food insecurity. I guess, you know, at the city level, what strategies are you thinking about? What can we implement to begin to address some of the root causes that are more holistic and take into account the whole community? Sure, thanks so much, Javier, for that question. Um, you know, as outlined in New York City's first ever 10-year food policy plan called Food Forward that my office issued at the beginning of this year, we are evolving and transforming the traditional emergency food system. The need to do this was actually highlighted throughout the pandemic, and Nate certainly spoke to this, and I, I really appreciate the, the, the framework and the context that President Williams used to outline the, the extent and the realities around food insecurity. Throughout the course of the pandemic, the number of food insecure New Yorkers significantly increased. However, it's really important to understand that not everyone who's experiencing food insecurity turns to kitchens and pantries, otherwise known as the emergency food network. In this city, in fact, only one in four individuals who is identifying as experiencing food hardship is actually turning to a kitchen or food pantry. So we know we need to shore up that system and make sure that it's as, best, as good as it can be. Dr. Leek spoke to some of the, the barriers that might prevent people from going to, um, to such a kitchen or a pantry, whether it's stigma, having not having the time to participate in that system, the lack of choice or the unfamiliarity with, with some of the food and knowing what to do with it. Particularly, I wanna address the need to have religiously and culturally um, appropriate foods. Um, sometimes that's not necessarily accessible, but we're working to address that. But also, New York City is dedicated not just to improving the emergency food system, but identifying new innovative models to better serve New Yorkers in need. We're soon going to be launching a pilot program for a select population called Groceries to Go New York City that's going to provide participants with a credit to be used online but to specifically buy groceries for pickup or delivery with actual New York City local grocers. This program is going to provide the much necessary financial relief to help families stretch their food budgets. It's going to provide choice. People can select the foods that they want and the dignity that they deserve, while also what we need to do more of is bolster our local grocers and our local food businesses. This in turn, as this crowd certainly knows, is going to have ripple effects in the economy by employing grocers and food workers. It's also going to help reduce food waste in the system, as you mentioned. When people can select the foods that they want, it gives them choice and it prevents having to take something home that you really don't know what you're going to do with or that, you're, that you know exactly how to prepare and to, to your liking. We're also going to be able to increase cultural appropriateness of food items as well by bringing on a number of kosher and halal uh, food businesses to support those populations. It's going to improve time equity. Many people cannot afford food delivery or it's not available to them at a convenient time or location or in the geography that they live. We're going to eliminate that. 
We also, and this is very important to me and to our approaches, is to make sure that we're creating a sense of a circular economy within the food landscape. All the money that goes to food banks, while it's so important that it is, could also be going in to support food vouchers with even greater system-wide impacts. We're creating ripple effects in the economy with vouchers and credit programs while supporting, again, those local businesses. Connecting food insecurity to circular economies at scale is something you'll see us doing a lot more with. Okay, thank you. Um, and, I, and I love this concept of the circular economy. I mean, Nate, you did that in Puerto Rico and, and I'm excited that, th that this model's here. Uh, quick question, follow-up question for Kate. Uh, when, when's the launch for, for this program, uh, kind of an estimated launch date? Um, the month of December, imminently. Okay, that's great, thank you. So let me let me turn over to Kim. Kim, you know, we know food waste is a major issue in the US, right? And your company, Copia, is a technology company. You develop market-based solutions to address this issue. So I'm really excited to have you on the panel on Copia. So tell us tell us about your business model. How does it address food waste? How does it address food loss? Who are your partners? How, how does this work? Sure, thank you so much. <clears throat> Good morning for everyone. Yet yeah, still morning, it's 7.30 on the West Coast, so I could do that. Um, so thank you for, for allowing us to be here. So as you mentioned earlier in the introduction, Copia makes it easy for all food businesses, regardless of size or type, to reduce and prevent their food waste. And we are experts in helping these businesses donate their surplus food to nonprofits most in need. So we have, as you mentioned, the very first automated platform that's making it really easy and turnkey for businesses to be able to match their surplus food and actually get it to the nonprofits in need. You know, one of the biggest issues that we find is that these nonprofits are serving their communities in so many incredible ways. And so having to then take the time and the resources to come find the food and pick up the food is actually a burden on them. So we try to eliminate that for them and instead make it as easy as possible for all, all participants, whether that be the businesses to um, uh, actually donate their food and transfer it there, but also track it um, because of the and so forth, whether that be from a compliance standpoint or for, um, uh, for food waste reduction. So, one of the things that I really appreciate hearing today, and you know, as we all are, are very well aware of, there are a lot of socioeconomic factors that entrench poverty and reduce overall access to food. So while I agree that providing food and vouchers is necessary for people, you know, especially in a na natural disaster situation, you know, to feed people today, we really need to think about long-term scalable solutions that feed into a circular economy because there's more than enough. There's three times more food that is being produced than there are mouths to feed. Hunger is not a scarcity issue. It's an ineffective redistribution of that food. Excuse me. So if we can empower businesses, small and large, to be able to redistribute that surplus, we can make a massive impact in a very scalable way. Uh, thank you, thank you, Kim. You know that that's an interesting stat because you, the USDA has some research that that shows that forty percent of all food produced is actually wasted, and and about eighty percent of that is perfectly edible, fine fine to eat. Mm -hmm. um, so so it is, a, it is a huge loss there. So Amen. A, a lot of these uh, programs and and, and efforts, they need financing, they need capital. Um, and, and I think this is where, where, you, where you come in, in terms of, you know, where you sit as, as the director of America director at Acumen. You know, what, what, how would you describe the approach of driving impact into the food and security space? And like, what's, how do you think about this? What's your theory of change? Like when you think about investing in, in companies, you know, you've made investments in this space before. Can you highlight that a little bit for us? Absolutely. Thank you, Javier. And it's a real pleasure to be here among this group. Um, at Acumen, we believe fundamentally that entrepreneurs play a critical role in tackling poverty. Here in the U.S., there are 100 million Americans that live within two times the federal poverty line. And we have this robust capital market, venture capital market, backing all sorts of innovative businesses. 
yet not nearly enough of those businesses are focused on the unfortunately mainstream economic vulnerability uh, that, that, is, that, we, that is our reality here in this country. So at Acumen, we look to back businesses that are creating pathways to prosperity, dignity, and health for low-income Americans across the U.S. Um, we think very much about the role that health plays, and I think Dr. Leake uh, really tied that together very, very well. The social determinants of health are a critical component of our investment thesis. As we think about the opportunity in food to, to create a world of greater food security, we think that, that really there's an opportunity to connect our food systems more directly to our healthcare systems. The social determinants of health are at the core of our thesis. We think about housing, we think about economic security, we think about food security as well. And I think as we look at Medicaid, we look at Medicare Advantage, there's tremendous opportunity to stitch uh, the, the health outcomes that can result from healthy eating to our food, to our healthcare system um, in a way that, that really drives entrepreneurial opportunities. So our model is to go out and find for-profit entrepreneurs at the earliest stage, invest in those businesses, and really roll up our sleeves to help them grow and, and create impact at scale. The reality is that there's all sorts of biases that entrepreneurs in this country face as a result of where you live, what you look like, the kind of business that you're building. We wanna go in and write that first check to that entrepreneur at that very early of stage and accompany them on a pathway to scale so that they can not just create a business that is reaching millions upon millions of lives, but that also has an impact that resonates with the systemic challenges that surround that company. So our, our view for the world is how do we empower entrepreneurs as agents of systemic change? And we think that food security is a critical part of creating better pathways to healthcare in this country. Thank you. Uh, let me turn to, to to Michael since we're talking about the the investments needed um, in this space. You know, as you know, as with you know, as we think about the intersection of finance and sustainability in the food and agricultural industry, what are some meaningful financial incentives? Like, how can we incentivize uh, to reduce food loss and food waste um, in in the system? Thanks, Javier, and uh, thanks for having me, having me here today. Um, to start with, uh, I think for those who aren't familiar with Rabobank, I want to provide a quick introduction you know, before moving forward. Rabobank is a Dutch cooperative bank you know, found in 1898. We're a global leader in financing food and agriculture you know, from farm to fork, as we like to say, and also renewable energy. You know, our mission is growing a better world together, and we're deeply invested in transitioning to a more sustainable F&A sector. You know, the why is simple. You know, if we want to continue continue to be relevant and feeding a growing world by 2050, we need in, to ensure that our clients are going to be able to produce more food with less environmental impact. One of the simplest and, and lowest hanging fruit part of this equation is getting more of the food grown from our lands, you know, to the people and overall reducing that food waste. And so, you know, as you mentioned, the intersection of finance and sustainability and the financial incentives to address food loss and waste. Um, when I think about you know, addressing food loss and waste more than any other climate solution, we see direct uh, payoff on multiple levels, you know, across the triple bottom line, if you will. You know, from a people perspective, you know, when you're able to, uh, you know, reduce the amount of food loss and waste, um, you're able to feed more people with what is being grown. You know, from a planetary perspective, you're eliminating, you know, the water impacts, the land impacts, or the emissions associated with those foods that are being lost and not being eaten. Um, and then ultimately, you know, from a profit perspective, uh, we're talking about statistics earlier, but, you know, a UN FAO study estimated that, that nearly $1 trillion worth of food is lost or wasted every year. You know, for profit minded companies or any companies really in the food industry, you know, improving this efficiency of the food grown and bought uh, compared to the food sold uh, and getting to the consumer is really core to their business. Um, so we see it as, as a win win all around and certainly a great place to get started. And one of the things I wanted to talk about today is the opportunity to really link the sustainability aspects you know, to financial products. So whether that be with sustainability linked loans or bonds, which people may be familiar with today. And the basic characteristic you know, of these financial products is that you're able to determine a set of sustainability KPIs or goals that one might have and really link that matrix of goals to the actual rate of the financial product so that when a company is successful in achieving the sustainability goals that it set for itself and that we've agreed upon uh, within that covenant, um, you have the opportunity to see, you know, a material yet marginal, um, you know, reduction of that rate, you know, and more truly linking the sustainability performance of a company to 
uh, you know, the actual, you know, financial rate and, you know, which links to, you know, the, the, the credit and risk profiles of these, of these companies. And so I think one of the things I wanted to talk about, you know, even more so when you're talking about these, um, you know, different KPIs that are chosen, you know, one of the most popular KPIs that will appear in any of these different financial products, you know, really relates to, uh, you know, carbon footprint, carbon reduction. Uh, certainly you can link that, you know, to food waste as well uh, and the impacts that are associated there. But one of the things that we did this year um, is we launched uh, an SDG 12.3 loan. So fully aligned with the UN SDG target of 12.3, uh, having food loss and waste by 2030 and really making use of the WRI food loss and waste protocol, which is a global standard for measuring and accounting and reporting on food waste. And what we're doing is, you know, having these sustainability linked products where all of the associated KPIs are directly addressing, um, you know, this, this UN SDG target of 12.3. And it's an opportunity really to make a statement, um, you know, that for whichever financial products you have that you think and you're going to tie, you know, ultimately your credit and risk profile to your ability to reduce uh, food waste across your business. And so um, we think this is exciting. You know, we think this is a transition type financial product. And, you know, as we move forward into the future, uh, you know, greater characteristics and ability of one to, to manage one's, you know, carbon footprint will be more and more material. But uh, this is a great way that we've seen for companies looking to make statements, um, looking to have an input impact and, and really reward uh, themselves for when they are able to become more sustainable uh, in a material way. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Michael. So these KPIs, these key performance indicators, um, have you have you been able to deploy a, a loan um, using these uh, KPI, these key performance indicators, a 12 point, as you call it, a 12.3 loan sustainable development goal loan? So we have, and uh, initially the, the main 12.3 loans that we've done have been in the Netherlands, you know, our home country. Uh, and certainly we've had ambition to do this in other regions. Uh, you know, we've seen, you know, across the, the variety and there really has been an uptick in, you know, sustainable finance this year and past years, but specifically this year. Uh, and we see that companies often, you know, who are quite interested in food waste will choose maybe one or two indicators on that, but certainly uh, you know, wanting to have a variety in there. Like I said, generally always a carbon footprint one. Um, you look at other aspects of the business, you might see some, you know, an increase in DE and I related indicators um, as well. And so, you know, we're still seeing a spread. We're seeing more interest in, in having this become a part of it. Um, and, but we're certainly, you know, for those that are really interested in, in, in kind of focusing on food waste to be able to do so. Um, but seeing them appear in any of the deals that we do is, is certainly um, uh, great to see. Thanks, thank you, Mike. Um, Nate, um, you know, in, in the work that you you were doing, you know, you you probably saw a lot of a lot of issues um, in terms of systems of how they work and, and policies in Puerto Rico and across your work in other in the areas across the U.S. What you know, what kind of changes would you like to see um, in our food system here in the U.S. that could perhaps help help farmers or I mean, what what what's what's you know something that kind of strikes you as as something that we just really could could change and that could move the needle. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done and we could probably have another two hours to, to do a deep dive onto that. But a couple of things I'll mention, you know, very high level, um, you know, our our founder, uh, Chef Jose Andres, has, has spoken about this quite a bit since the beginning of the pandemic. But I think one of, you know, one of our biggest overarching challenges as a country and, um, you know, in our food system in and of itself is that we don't really have a national holistic view around food, right? We have a U.S. Department of Agriculture. We do not have a U.S. Department of Food. And as so many have mentioned, Dr. Leek, and as, as Eamon mentioned, you know, food touches all of these other areas, right? Food is interconnected to health um, and well-being. Food is interconnected to education. Food is, you know, food is, is everywhere. And so when we don't have a holistic view around food and the, the individuals making our policy around food, that tends to have a real detrimental impact on uh, the, what, what ends up you know, coming out uh, in terms of, of funding, in terms of legislation, in terms of things at the national level. Now, we are starting to see some major shifts more locally. I mean, Kate here is a perfect example where New York City has a director of food policy. We're seeing this in other cities. I live in Washington, D.C., where we also have 
a director of food policy, food is starting to be at the center of the conversation, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, we are working uh, with the White House and Congress pushing for the first national conference on food, nutrition, hunger, and health. This would be the first national summit on food since 1969. Uh, when it was held by Richard Nixon and a number of uh, our current policies uh, that we still operate came out of that moment. Actually, a lot of our food policies to date um, stemmed from that 1969 conference. So I think there's a huge opportunity here um, as we're looking high level simply to start acknowledging the importance of food, start looking at nutrition, start to understand that right now every dollar we're putting into our broken food system has a as a detrimental impact of two dollars in terms of the outcome um and so you know there's there's so much work to be done i think the other thing that i'll mention briefly is there's a lot of space for innovation i think this is also an exciting time i think as as uh kim mentioned you know and the work that they're doing with copia you know there are really interesting innovative companies working on new approaches um you know as as kate mentioned only one in four families were going to traditional food support systems, right? And, you know, we live in a time now, I'm sure all of you saw the, the, the images on TV of people waiting hours in their cars to get food, you know, in San Antonio or people we were serving in New York City and, and, you know, in Queens, for example, where families would come and wait for hours and hours in line to get food for the day. And meanwhile, we live in a world now where you can go on your phone and in 30 minutes probably get a delivery from Amazon to your front door, right? So what can we do to kind of think of new systems? So one of the things that, that came out of our work in New York City, we launched a program that we call WCK Direct. It's a text to order program for families. We have hundreds of families in New York enrolled in it now. And it's that in that sense rolled out to other cities like Chicago, Oakland, Baltimore, Los Angeles, and here in DC as well. Um, and the idea is that by using this to simple technology of texting, families can request food assistance right now from restaurants, um, but eventually that could be food boxes or products that they want um, and do it at their own time when they need it. Some families might need support in the middle of the day or they're at work in the middle of the day and they need some support in the evening time. So it puts that agency and choice back in their hands. So that's one tiny example, but I think there's, there's an opportunity to really think about, you know, as we're doing this work and as we're looking for how can we both look at the long-term solutions? Also, what are some of the short-term innovations that we can build to, you know, to just improve the way that we're doing this work right now? No, th th thank you, Nate, for, for that. I mean, that's that's really this uh, World Central Kitchen Direct. Um, you know, it's really interesting, really fascinating. It, you know, it takes into account the circular economy. You know, the, the time equity that we that that Kate had mentioned earlier. Um, Kate. From your perspective, I mean, you're 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 at the city level. You have this this interesting bird's eye view, as I mentioned earlier. I mean, what what's your what's your take on 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 this question? Well, you know, I want to appreciate Nate's points, um, and for, and here's a you know example of thinking about our response during certainly the COVID crisis, and also how we're we're carrying that forward, having the opportunity to serve as the you know, director of the mayor's office of food policy, make sure that I am I'm thinking about not just, you know, the the human, um, the social service side of things, but also thinking about business, thinking about how we can do more to support and attract businesses to communities that are suffering from a lack of businesses, that are from a lack of 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 capital to be able to um, to make their businesses thrive to inspire different um, social ventures who might be able to support not just a, you know, a, a traditional market based solution, but something that that centers the social determinants of health or centers. I loved um, hearing um, about the SDG um, loan opportunity. We have commitments certainly around around food and climate. Um, our whole procurement system we're looking to overhaul to make sure that we're making purchases um, with consideration, certainly for health and nutrition, but also for workforce to make sure that we're doing business with people that are good businesses um, and that are um, uh, really great to the environment or as best as they can be. 
So this this sort of this this perch, if you will, al allows for the type of of, uh, of coordinated approach, but also reminds us to not lo lose sight of the human centered necessity of designing all of these um, responses uh, around. And so, you know, again, I'll give the ex example um, of the fact that one in four New Yorkers is using a soup kitchen or a food pantry. We're also trying to solve for those other three quarters. And we know that even if it is a donation, a dollar, two dollars, whatever it might be, people are willing to give something rather than nothing. And so how we can attract those types of um, business ventures, um, I'm really attracted. Um, I know every table is looking into this type of model as well and many others to really start to, to lead the country in ways in which we can uh, be addressing food insecurity with dignity and with market-based solutions. So, so Eamon, let me, let me bring you back to the conversation. So how, how can capital drive this, right? Because we're, we, we can't, we're not gonna solve this problem just with philanthropic dollars. I mean, we need market-based you know, solutions have to play a role here to move the needle. So let me ask you, Eamon, what, what, what can capital do here from where you sit? And Kim, from where you sit, from your perspective, right? What, what do you need capital to do to help move the needle from, 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 your, from your situation? So, Eamon, let, let's start with you. Thanks, Javier. Yeah, and, and Kate, just to, I think it might, might be helpful to build on the example of every table that, that you just mentioned. Every table is an investment that we've made. Uh, they're based in Los Angeles with the vision of making healthy food accessible to everyone everywhere. They do that with a central production model, low cost retail location, smart fridges, direct to, to home distribution, a whole host of institutional sales to public and private sector uh, organizations and have seen remarkable growth. And you know, rather than see the pandemic uh, as an opportunity to, to hibernate as a business, they saw that an opportunity to spring, to spring into action and take their central kitchen and to make healthy food accessible to even more uh, folks in Southern California who need it. Um, what's, what's really exciting to me about Every Table is not just that they're making healthy food available at a price point that's accessible to folks and distributing it in a multimodal way that folks can actually get it to their homes. It's also that they're thinking about how do we actually create all of the opportunity around food. Nate, to your point, the, you know, how do we think about the economic opportunity of food? How do we think about the health opportunity of food? They, so they're thinking about food as medicine and integrating into the healthcare system, as I described before. They're thinking about building a social equity franchising model so that low-income entrepreneurs from the communities that they're serving can actually own and run every table franchises and build pathways to wealth for themselves and their families that create remarkable, you know, catapulting uh, you know, economic change in these folks' lives. Um, you know, but, but the reality to your question, Javier, is that the <clears throat> capital requirements are not simple. This is not, you know, just a, you know, an app in Palo Alto that's going to see, you know, some kind of crazy growth and, you know, that sort of fits the venture capital mold. It requires a really creative approach to investing to make this model work. We've invested as equity investors in the company, and yes, that's required. The company has also raised philanthropy to think about how do we build a world-class training model for the uh, franchisees that are going to participate in the social equity franchise program. They've created a, a loan fund uh, to receive program-related investments, PRIs, to help capitalize these franchises for for somebody that wants to build a mcdonald's there's effectively a net worth requirement you got to be a millionaire you know they're they're creating an innovative loan program that enables you know folks from the community they serve to create pathways to wealth through this franchising program so it's about how do we bring together impact seeking equity investors philanthropists you know grant uh, uh you know debt investors to really think about all and, and carve up the business in the right way that brings all those folks to the table. That takes creativity because many of these things haven't been done before. It takes collaboration because it takes all all folks. And and I think to the points of uh, you know the last two pieces, it takes real innovation. How do we rally around entrepreneurs and think about taking these models from success locally to success at scale? Kim, thank you. <clears throat> I would second everything that you you three all just said. Um, I think you you eloquently articulated the value. Um, of the holders coming together, it's going into these businesses and these innovative solutions to be able to scale, but it's going to also take government entities. Government can't do this alone. The public, you know, the public side can't do this alone. The, you know, Kate's doing incredible work in New York, but that's not without the assistance of technologies and partners and capital. So it takes all of us to come together to really make an impact. You know, Nate, I really appreciate the work that World Central Kitchen is doing 
um, on a national level. Uh, Copia just signed on with the Healthy Living Coalition's open letter to Senator Toomey, who's trying to expand the Emerson Act. For those of you who may not be aware, the Emerson Act provides additional protection to businesses who are donating in good faith. And so at the end of the day, if we think about the fact that we have enough food to go around currently, how do we get that food in the hands of the people that need it? And Kate, you know, you, you so eloquently put that we want to be able to deliver with dignity. We want people to feel um, a sense of pride with, with what they're doing. And we want to remove from, forgive the, the pun, remove hunger from their plates so that they can focus on building their lives or building their communities and impact, making a bigger impact beyond themselves. And so at the core, if we have the food, how do we enable the businesses to be able to do something with it? And so that's where we're really invested is making it as easy as possible. Um, yeah, Michael, you made an excellent point. Food donation is a triple bottom benefit for business. There are very few that actually exist in its truest form. There is people, you are feeding your neighbors in need. <clears throat> By diverting food from landfill, you are, you are reducing carbon emissions. You are saving gallons of water. You are not investing in the, the resources that would need otherwise to be to produce new food. And then profit. If our government is allowing us right now, instead of you know uh, uh, providing food to everyone for short term, if, if they are providing um, uh, the ability for these businesses to take a meaningful tax deduction at the end of the year, it's a it's a no brainer. I mean, people profit planet like it actually is working in real time here under the, the CARES Act right now. Businesses are able to take off right off two uh, X their cost basis of food up to 25 percent of their total income. That is meaningful. So how do we encourage them to take advantage of this by doing the right thing? So that's what we're really interested in. And one other point that I'll make, we work with some incredible organizations, big and small, from the bacon and honey coffee shops in Los Angeles to the Cheesecake Factory, which has a global or a national um, presence. But we also work with healthcare systems. Um, and this is really, really meaningful because we know that Food insecurity leads to an uptick of rates of chronic diseases. Um, you know, this is triggered by poor dietary habits. And the result of this is a vicious cycle. It's, you know, going to increase your medical bills. It's going to reduce unemployment. And then you're going to see more medical resources needed to be put towards these people who are facing food insecurity. So we have incredible partner in Sutter Health, uh, Jack Breeze and his team, they've got a number of their hospitals that have recognized, wait a second, there is a perpetual cycle that we need to get in and we need to like stop this. So they are donating their excess food to their local neighbors um, in need and they're doing an incredible job of it. And Sutter Health is a nonprofit. They're not even, they're not even taking advantage of the tax deduction at the end of the year. So it really is to tie this all back together, going to take every stakeholder, whether that be you know, the innovative technologies, the, the capital to support those, the government entities, and also the businesses to make this work. Um, so I'm very excited about the future because there really is, you know, a, a solution that's, that's in front of us. And no, that's a very good point. And, you know, especially about the upstream and downstream spending on healthcare, you know, we, we spend billions of dollars on, 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 on folks, um, healthcare, uh, that could probably eliminated or reduced significantly if we were to invest early on in healthy food and healthy access. So we have just a, a minute or so left. So I want to do one final one final question before turning it over to, to Dominic. Um, what, you know, let's conclude with this question. You know, what, what new trend will we be discussing a year from now to address food insecurity? Either what new trend, I mean, you know, you know, the economy is, is, is moving on. Then the pandemic is, you know, up in, you know, I don't know where we are with the pandemic with this new Omni, Omicron uh, variant. Um, but, you know, putting that putting that aside, I mean, what would you like to see a year from now in terms of movement in this space? I mean, let me start with Eamon. Um, I think for me, the 
innovation in distribution of food and a culturally relevant food system. Those are two, two themes that I'm very, very excited about building towards. Michael. There we go, sorry, I had to find my button again. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, my perspective, you know, I think a, a little different, but we kind of, you know, hit on it a bit, but just the, the greater realization of, of climate and environmental related risks and the overall credit and risk profiles of, of companies and really being able to dig into that. Um, you know, when you talk about climate risk, for example, you have acute risk, which is, you know, individual events, you know, such as hurricanes, the drought, storms, et cetera. Uh, and you also have transition risks, and these are the risks of, you know, for a business, how are they going to be able to deal with the transitions that are being occurring in a changing climate moving forward? And so this can, you know, include, you know, regulatory risk of, you know, include risks of being able to manage one's own carbon footprint and others. And certainly as we dig further and further into the details, being able to deal, um, you know, with food waste and, you know, and, and ultimately food insecurities and, and recognizing that those who are able to be more efficient, who are able to, you know, reduce the amount that they send to landfill, who are able to kind of look at that whole EPA food recovery hierarchy, you know, first reducing the, the sources, but then, you know, feeding hungry people and do that more efficiently and effectively. And we understand that as being of greater, you know, credit and, and, and less of a risk, you know, moving forward. Kim? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful that we can all come together to really, really figure out a solution here. Um, you know, this is for the greater good of humanity and our planet. And so I'm very, very um, bullish and, and excited that all stakeholders, whether it be for profits, like the Copias, the profits, you know, the, the public benefit companies um, and the government entities and the community leaders can have open and honest dialogue to figure out how we can do this at scale. Um, and I think that this is just the beginning. Okay. Sure. Um, we saw that with government supports, such as increasing the benefit allotments for the SNAP program, continued stimulus payments, we prevented a, a catastrophic uh, rise in food insecurity. I hope we continue to realize the role that wages and actual dollars have to address and solve for food insecurity. We'll always be putting meals on plates to, for a dinner tonight, but to really address food insecurity, we have to really think bigger. And, and Nate? Um, I, I can't uh, echo what Kate said more. I mean, I think, uh, you know, increasing wages and getting to a livable wage is going to be the most important thing for food insecurity across our country. Um, but I also, um, a couple of things I'd love to see over the next year, I think, um, you know, this coming out of this pandemic or that we're still in, uh, the spotlight on food and the importance of food, um, I hope that can lead to some major change. And uh, something that that Jose, our founder, says a lot is that, you know, food needs to be seen as a national security issue. We need to prioritize it the same way we spend for our national security, um, because it is, it really is. Um, I, I also think that we, we really need to think about where it starts, which is in our schools. Uh, one of the things that came out of this pandemic was that we, I think, woke up as a country to the fact that our schools don't just educate our kids, but they feed our kids. And when those schools went away, all of a sudden it was like, wait a minute, how, how are our kids going to eat? Um, and we need to make the proper investments to enable our schools to feed our children healthy, nutritious food. Um, and we've been going the wrong direction for a long time. Um, there are some, some amazing innovations and progress being made. Um, and I think one of the biggest things I wanna see over the next year is um, we need to, we need to have universal school meals. Kids need to be able to eat. We need to see food as a universal right. And our children should not be without food. And so we're going to be pushing for that. Um, we'll see how far we get, but, uh, into the next year with, with upcoming, uh, child nutrition reauthorization, uh, in Congress. And we need to demand it. We need to make sure. And, th and this happened. We shoot, we showed it was possible during the pandemic. We can do it. 
So there's no reason not to continue it. So that's something that I'd love to see uh, over the next year. Great. Well, thank you all for a great discussion. Clearly, we need more time for this important topic. I want to turn over the virtual mic to my colleague, Dominic Ramos-Ruiz, to provide closing remarks. Dominic? Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Javier, and thanks again to President Williams and all of our speakers for such a thought-provoking discussion. As Javier mentioned, I'm Dominic Ramos-Ruiz with the Community Development Team, and I'd love to just close out this session with a few final reflections. And I think what I found particularly exciting about this morning's conversation and, and so many others that we've had with respect to food insecurity is that we haven't spent so much time dwelling on the problems or dreaming of new methods of solving them, but rather we've been discussing impactful solutions that are already having success in the marketplace today. The solutions shared this morning were neither conceptual nor theoretical. The solutions were real. The growth objectives were actionable and with most seeming to be within everyone's capacity and ability to achieve. Uh, in fact, every organization represented on the panel is achieving these growth objectives as we speak. Uh, when you think of World Central Kitchen and how they've expanded their successful programs beyond Puerto Rico and in, into new markets like the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guatemala, and, and many others. And you also had every table, which which Eamon mentioned was Acumen was an early investor in, which was soon opening its first location in New York City after yet another successful fundraising. And of course, Copia having now distributed more than 3.5 million meals. And for a company that was launched, I believe, in 2016, that, that is quite remarkable progress. And last but not least, the city of New York, who launched the first ever food policy master plan, and that's already being looked to as a model for other cities around the world. So I think it's really important to note that these models are not just helping to address hunger, but also many other systemic challenges that are faced by low and moderate income communities. Some of these solutions are helping to address climate change, while others are producing good paying jobs and providing new possibilities for upward economic mobility. And these are just a few examples. There are countless others out there, obviously, that with the right capital awareness or resources could have an even greater impact on helping to solve this issue and to ensure that everyone has access to a healthier future. And that's really what we're aiming to do here at the New York Fed and on the community development team by bringing together unlikely partners to cultivate this fertile ground. So this is our first public discussion on the topic, but hopefully it won't be the last. I think we have a few things in store for the first quarter of next year. And um, with that, I wish everyone a wonderful afternoon and more to come soon. Have a great day, everyone.